Okay, let me start by saying this. Banjo-Tooie is not a perfect game. Among the fanbase, it is actually a very divisive game. So much so that Banjo-Tooie is often widely considered to be something of an outcast to the Banjo-Kazooie franchise family. Cast off by fans, panned by game reviewers, and invariably outshined by its predecessor, Banjo-Kazooie. And hey, this reality in my book is completely justified. Banjo-Kazooie struck a near-perfect balance with the collectathon formula that was so popular during the N64 era. Banjo-Kazooie was the definitive way to craft a collectathon in the eyes of pretty much everybody. And while I myself hold this game in pretty high regard as well, I find that when playing it, there's just something about the whole experience that leaves me wishing there was... more. Not that the gameplay isn't satisfying or fun or anything like that, but I just can't help but shake this feeling that there just isn't enough realized potential here. The levels themselves, while well-balanced and engaging, feel like they end before they truly begin. Like all the challenges and puzzles for Jiggies feel like level 1 tier or, in some cases, tutorial level challenges, if that makes sense. It's all way too easy, and the setup for these challenges and for the stages themselves all just feel so basic. I think Banjo-Kazooie suffers from what I call the first game in a series syndrome. Pretty clever, right? Basically, since it's the first game in the series, then that naturally means that many of its ideas are going to be at the ground floor stage of their evolution. And it'll only be when a sequel comes out that we'll see these ideas be realized a bit more thoroughly. That's where Banjo-Tooie comes in. Now, here's the thing. I think, for the most part, we can all agree that Banjo-Tooie is absolutely a larger, more ambitious, more challenging, more self-realized, more evolved imagination of Banjo-Kazooie. There's more characters, more collectibles, more moves to learn, more eggs to shoot, bigger boss fights, much larger worlds, a strong sense of world building. The stakes in the plot are higher. Grunty has changed into a more serious and terrifying version of herself and has become even more powerful and thus an even greater threat. There are more Jinjos to rescue, more mini-games, more raunchy jokes, more give zero fucks Kazooie banner. You get the idea. Banjo-Tooie is exactly what happens when you catch lightning in a bottle, Banjo-Kazooie, and expand on it to find out its full potential. And then take it a few steps too far. And that right there is the kicker. Because in my view, this game is just a few notches short of being actually a pretty good 3D platformer. But what holds it back from being in that top tier is its relentless quest to waste your goddamn time. Jesus. Not to mention its quest to suck its own dick. Like, we get it. This is Banjo-Kazooie, bigger, better, uncut. Everything is bigger, which therefore means better, right? 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 Kind of. I, for one, actually prefer these stages to the Kazooie stages. Yeah, I said it. And I'm not just saying that to be cool. I genuinely think these worlds do a phenomenal job of establishing a unique and interesting environment that makes me want to explore it more. They do everything that Kazooie did right, right up to the music, the cast of characters you meet and their fun personalities, the presentation, the secrets, but this time around, these worlds are just far more layered. There's just so much going on in each of these worlds and all these elements feel so connected to each other. Not only that, but what you do in these worlds actually has consequences. It's not as simple as activate the switch, complete the preset minigame, get jiggy, and move on like nothing happened. When you traverse through these worlds, it feels like completing objectives actually has an effect on the world around you. 
Ass blasting all the savage, bloodthirsty Oongabungas while providing food and heat to the pacifist Oogaboogle tribe. Feels like I'm actually quelling an all-out war between two tribes in Pterodactyl land. Not only that, but these worlds have this way about them. Just the sheer scale of them, combined with the way their paths intersect with one another and lead into other areas so seamlessly, it makes me feel lost in them, but in the best way possible. I honestly don't know where I'm going to end up when I'm exploring a random tunnel, and I love that feeling. Will it lead me to a whole new underwater cave system? Will it lead me to a boss fight? A jiggy? Or will it actually drop me off in some random cave in Glitter Gulch Mine? And boom! That is impeccable world building right there. I never feel like these stages are separate or closed off spaces from each other. With the way these worlds merge together in such creative ways, I actually feel like each world is just a natural part of the overworld itself. Not just an artificially tacked on dreamscape like in Banjo-Kazooie or Super Mario 64. Overall, Banjo-Kazooie's worlds fit the bill in making you feel like you're on a real adventure. With their sheer size, spectacle, and depth just begging you to explore more of them. And you'll never get tired of seeing what each new area has to offer. So there, problem solved, right? Banjo-Tooie's worlds are ambitiously designed and thoroughly packed with content to keep players occupied. That means they're perfect in every way, right? Right? You see, when a game throws so many different collectibles at you, and more than half of these collectibles are absolutely pivotal to your advancement to the next area, and on top of that, they're spread throughout these, again, massive levels, you're gonna run into some problems. Like, for starters, oh, I don't know, it's simply not fun to talentron up and down every corner of the map for collectibles. Again, it's fun to explore these maps for the sake of exploration itself, but it is not fun when you're specifically looking for something. It's also not fun when the game presents you with a path or doorway that you need a specific item or character to pass through, thereby sending you back to the opposite end of the map to grab this item or switch to that character just so you can jog your way all the way back to where you were before. And remember, these maps are huge, so having to back and forth like this all the time gets extremely grating and time consuming when you're just trying to pass through one single door. This is exactly what I meant earlier when I said this game loves to waste your time. Why? Maybe it's because the developers wanted to show off just how big these worlds were or just how much stuff they packed into this game. Or maybe they were just dragging things out for the sake of extending your playtime in the game itself. I don't know. But, I digress. Despite the passionate complaining I've done for the past several minutes, my feelings on these particular components of the game are not representative of the entirety of the game itself. Most of my issues stemming around the gameplay are very much concentrated in Grunty Industries specifically. I truly believe the game's reputation would have preserved itself a bit better had this level never existed. But as for the rest of them, it's really not all that bad. Mayhem Temple and Glitter Gulch Mine are basic enough as it is and you can easily navigate your way through most of their jiggies without much frustration. Witchy World is actually a respectably well-designed level that's pretty hard to get lost in as well. And Jolly Rogers Lagoon? Honestly, pretty tame for a water level. The only glaring obscenity about this level as a whole is it forces you to use the underwater first-person egg shooting ability a few times too many, which is just ridiculous to use when you only have one joystick to simultaneously aim and control the camera with. Aside from that, pretty doable level. Pterodactyl land becomes far less confusing once you realize that the map is literally just a giant circle, with a massive mountain in the middle to act as a landmark to center your navigation around, and Cloud Cuckoo Land and Herald Fire Peaks are just plain fun. Now, would getting jiggies in these levels be more consistently enjoyable had there not been so many instances where the game forced you to run back and forth so much? Whether it be to transform, switch characters, or pick up an object? Probably. But I think it's important to remember the era in which this game was developed. 
game developers had only just started getting their feet wet with the 3D space. And so the ideas being tossed around on how to fill a player's time in said 3D platformers were different back then. Sure, they weren't perfect, and the endless back and forth fetch quests have certainly shown their age in recent years, but in my opinion, that shouldn't detract from the rest of the game's overall charm, as well as the parts of the game that are genuinely fun and satisfying to complete. You've got the loads upon loads of mini-games that, aside from a select few, don't really get many complaints from me, and actually offer a nice break from the flow of the traditional gameplay. I really enjoyed the Saucer Apparel minigame, as masochistic as that may sound to some people. I think Saucer Apparel offers a nice challenge that many of the minigames, while still fun, don't offer as vehemently. And I actually beat this one on my first try this time around, when in years prior I probably would have been at least 30 minutes in before giving up on it and furthermore myself entirely. And then there's the boss battles. Wow. Just wow. It's incredible the amount of effort the developers actually put towards just the presentation of these bosses alone. Let me tell you, there's no shortage of epic when it comes to these boss fights. When these guys pop up, they pop up hard, and you immediately realize that they are not screwing around. Because the thing about boss fights, from my perspective, in the year 2020, boss fights have become a lost art. There was a time, not long ago, when games actually cared about their bosses. I mean, it makes sense, right? Boss fights act as quintessential milestones throughout the game. The few moments where you are forced to put everything you've learned up to that point to the test. It was basically one of the Ten Commandments of video games at one point, and well, Banjo-Tooie understood that perfectly. I cannot give them enough credit for what they did with these bosses. They are all challenging, they are all intimidating, and they are all just a perfect vehicle to test everything that you and the player have learned up to that point. Except for this guy. He sucks. I mean, he just kind of walks, and you just shoot eggs at him, and he dies. You know what? You're actually pathetic, my dude. Banjo-Tooie is a good game. Yeah, I said it. I don't care. Underneath all the repetitive backtracking and arguably dated game design, underneath all that is a good game. It's there, people. It's there in the colorful characters and music, and the amount of care that went into crafting its massive levels that just beg for you to explore it all. This game demands that you immerse yourself within its adventure. Because that's the thing. I can't, in good conscience, dislike a game that clearly cared so much about providing you with nothing else but a good time. Because if I'm being honest, there aren't many games anymore that pack as much content as Banjo-Tooie does. This game came from an era where game developers really, really cared about defying expectations. And sure, maybe that did lead to a few overambitious projects at times, but I would rather developers swing for the fences and fall short than play it safe and under-deliver in the long run. Banjo-Tooie, in the eyes of most fans, may have fallen flat on its face for simply being too ambitious, but I, on the other hand, simply choose to look at the glass half full. I love the ambition I see here. Even if it gives way to some tedious gameplay every now and then, it doesn't matter. Because in the end, Banjo-Tooie gave us its all. And because of that, I truly believe in my heart of hearts that Banjo-Tooie deserves better.